Hey, we are so happy that you have tuned in for Church Online this week. And before we start in just a few minutes, I want to let you know about a couple of things. Number one, you can follow along with the message notes at bccnd.org slash outline or in the Vineyard app. And if you have kids, you can find all of the resources available for lesson plans, activities, and worship at bccnd.org slash about slash kids. And students, if you want to get your worship on, you can actually find a curated playlist just for you at bccnd.org slash about slash students. So now if you want to grab your coffee, grab your friends, grab your family, anybody that you're around, we're getting ready for Church Online.
You're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our praise. We're going to sing a new song today. And this song is straight from Scripture. And this is God's heart for every single one of us. So as we sing this together, let's sing it over ourselves. Let's sing it over our friends, our families, our neighbors. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing it again, the Lord bless. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. So agree, sing amen together.
you are fighting for us, God, that you love us, that you know us, that you are a good, good God. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, you can have a seat. Man, what an incredible time of worship. We hope that you experience the power and presence of God wherever you are watching online today. And in fact, if you are tuning in online, we would love for you to fill out the online connect card at btcnd.org slash connect or on the connect card tab in the Vineyard app. That allows us to let you know that you are tuning in today and we can get in touch with you. In fact, we're so excited to get in touch with you that we are reopening on June 13th and 14th. And so for more updates on that, you can go to bccnd.org slash updates. But we are so excited that we're actually having step one of the growth track the weekend before on June 7th at 1245 p.m. Now, if you want more updates on the growth track, you can do two things. You can go to bccnd.org slash next steps, or you can go to the next steps tab in the Vineyard app to find out more information. Now, I know it's been a crazy time, but we have seen the hand of God working in mighty and powerful ways in the vineyard and through stories that we have heard. Last week, we heard a story about two people overcoming COVID-19, and we just know that God is constantly at work. And we have seen more and more people experiencing the message of Jesus online than we ever thought was possible. And so thank you for your continued generosity and your continued giving. We have seen people give their tithe faithfully through the midst of this pandemic. And we have had our socks just blown off by offerings that have gone above and beyond what we ever expected. So thank you. And if you want to give, you can go to btcnd.org slash give, or you can go to the Give tab in the Vineyard app and embrace radical generosity that changes lives. And now for this week's message. Hey, so glad that you could tune in, join us for Church Online right here at the Vineyard. My name is Elisha, and we're continuing our series, I Promise, where we've been looking at these amazing promises of God. And this week, I'm going to be talking about uh, the future. Um, no, not the rapper future. <laughs> our future, the future, the promise God has made toward us for the future. But before we jump into that, we at the Vineyard do want to recognize and honor that this is Memorial Day weekend. And I, I have a special appreciation for Memorial Day weekend. I come from a military family on both sides. Uh, my grandfather, who served on the USS Indianapolis, uh, lost all of his friends when that ship was sunk. And his flag hangs in my office, and I look at it every day, and also the man who led my parents to Christ and dedicated me to God as a baby was a United States Marine that fought on the shores of Iwo Jima in World War II. And so we wanted to take a moment to remember the fallen and the price that freedom has cost this country, and we want to share this video with you. Some time back, I received in the name of our country the bodies of four Marines who had died while on active duty. I said then that there is a special sadness that accompanies the death of a serviceman, for we're never quite good enough to them. Not really, we can't be, because what they gave us is beyond our powers to repay. And so when a serviceman dies, it's a tear in the fabric, a break in the hole, and all we can do is remember. It is, in a way, an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them and what they did and why they had to be brave for
For me, Memorial Day is so deeply connected uh, to the work of Jesus. It was Jesus himself who said, no greater love has anyone than that they would lay down their life for their friends. And the liberties that we enjoy as citizens in this great nation were paid for with the blood of brave men and women. And in the same way that we enjoy as citizens of God's kingdom, it was paid for with the blood of God's only son. And so I believe God himself has a special place in his heart for Memorial Day because he also relates to having lost a loved one for the sake of others. And as we think and remember these men and women that gave up their future, for us to have a future, it's my privilege to be able to talk about God's promise of the future. We're in a place right now um, in the world that the entire world is looking forward uh, with anticipation, possibly, to some sense of normalcy coming back, and also with fear. Many people are looking forward to, uh, you know, possibly what will happen with the economy or what are the risks to their health going forward. And there's such a tension right now that we're caught in. And I believe tonight that God is going to give courage to our hearts to face the days to come with boldness and with confidence. So I'm so glad that you're here tuned in today. And when it comes to the future, I would love to be able to like talk about one of the books uh, of the, the habits of highly effective people or possibly the, the 10 biblical secrets of success to have your dream life. And all of these things are good and to build roadmaps for the future. But in just the few short minutes we have today, I want to talk about this biblical concept that even supersedes all of those things. There's a place in the Bible where it says, if God is not the one building the city, then those who are laboring are working for nothing. I'm going to say that again. If God is not the one who is building the city, then the laborers are working for nothing. And as I read that scripture, I, I really began to think about it in my own life. How often have I done that? How often have I decided to build my own city, my own life, pick out my own path, and never consult God about it? How often do we do that, where we, we just decide on a certain idea, or we decide on a certain dream, and then we start putting all of our effort, all of our energy into it, and we never, ever consult God about it? And then when it falls through, we're wondering, you know, how did that happen? Or, or maybe... Maybe it's a scenario where we never consulted God, we never asked God for guidance, and then all of our dreams come true. All of our uh, plans succeed, and then all of a sudden we have everything we ever wanted, but we ended up building a life where the only person that benefited was us. And we might even say, thank you God for the life that I have, but if we're living a selfish life with a religious label, then we're missing out on the destiny that God purposed for us, to impact people's lives and to make a difference forever. And it was Jesus himself who once told a story about a man who was planning for the future. And this man had so much increase, so much wealth, so much additional um, you know, uh, resources that he was getting in his life that he had to build bigger barns. He had to build bigger storehouses. And then he steps back. He looks at everything he made, and he goes, oh, take, oh, take comfort, heart. Rest easy, mind. We're sleeping well today. And you know what? Every day for a lot of years to come, because I have everything I could ever need, and I'm set for the future. But Jesus replies and says, what a foolish man. He says, what a foolish man, because he didn't know that that night his life would be required of him, and he would have to give account for his soul. And then he says, what good will all of that earthly gain do for him then? And see, God wants to abundantly bless our life. But the blessings that he wants to put on us is a blessing that transcends earthly gain. It's a blessing that transcends monetary wealth or earthly status because there are a lot of rich people that have poor attitudes. There are a lot of poor and impoverished people who act like they own the world. And if we spend our life hoping in a future where we have something that's going to change our circumstances, then we're hoping in something so finite and so small. And, you know, I really miss, let me just say this, I really miss being able to be here and worship together, to shout and to sing. I'm privileged to just be able to be in here and be in the room during worship. That was an incredible time, guys. I miss being in here with everybody and being fed spiritually. And I was telling God, I said, I'm just hungry. I'm just hungry for more. I want more of you. I just, I just wish it could be Sunday again. And God spoke to me. 
in my heart. And he said, I didn't create you to hunger for Sunday. He said, I didn't create you to hunger for Sunday. He said, I created you to hunger for the sun today. I'm going to say that again. He didn't create us to hunger for Sunday, but rather for the sun, the son of God today. So often we get in this place of looking forward to Sunday or looking forward to, let's say, someday, someday. You know, if I could just meet my goals, if I could just meet that girl, if I could just meet that guy, if I could just have that job, if I could just have that title, if I could just have that position, if I could just have this dream come true, then then finally I would be okay. Finally in the future, oh God, give me that future where I'll finally be satisfied. And we end up putting our hope in a someday instead of the sun today, and we are not fulfilled. We're not satisfied. We're looking around for some future to come to make us happy when God has already something so much bigger than this. And I want, if you're following along with our digital outline, you can read in our outline, in Acts chapter one, look at this last conversation Jesus has with any of his friends on planet earth. This is the last time. This is the last time he's going to talk to anybody on this side of heaven. And there he is in Acts chapter one, verse four, it says, he commanded them. He commanded them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of of the Father, to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me, he says. For John truly baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Ghost not many days from now. So I want you to pay attention to this. He says, last conversation, he says, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And then he says, it's being baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost. And so then his disciples, look at what his disciples say. His disciples say, well, Jesus, are you now, continuing in verse 6, they say, Jesus, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you now, Jesus, finally bring the future we need to be satisfied? Jesus, now that after you've been crucified and resurrected and displayed your godhood, are you going to finally give us the satisfaction we're looking for? Are you going to finally give us the thing that we need to be happy? Are you going to bring the future so that we can be satisfied? Ever Jesus' way replies and says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that are under my Father's authority, but... They wanted the future to come. They wanted the the satisfaction of the future to be there because they thought that what they needed was for the kingdom of Israel to be this ruling kingdom. They thought that they had figured out what the perfect future for them would look like. But Jesus says, no, that's not what's important right now. Here's what's important. You will receive power. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So I want you to look at this. He says, go and wait for the promise Go and wait for the promise, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when you receive. When you receive that baptism, you will receive power. And I'm telling you right now, there are so many of us that are looking forward, that are looking forward to possibly the future, just finally arriving, and we're missing the very power of what we need. Oh, well, one day I hope I get over my anxiety when he's given us the promise of his Holy Spirit, baptized us in power to face down our anxiety and say, hold on, no, I'm free from this. The Apostle Paul begins to speak of this exact same promise in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. He says this, God has put his seal, his seal on us and put his spirit into our hearts, God, his spirit into our hearts, the pledge and the foretaste of future blessing, the pledge and the foretaste of future blessing, the promise, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power, the seal, the pledge, the foretaste of future blessing. And I wonder how many of us are exactly like the disciples were, just hoping for one day, hoping for some day, hoping for that time when exactly what I need will finally come to pass, and then I'll be happy, then I'll be satisfied, then I'll be fulfilled. And here Jesus has already given us, he has already given us the down payment, the foretaste of the future blessings to come. See, we're hoping for this future, and in reality, What Jesus paid for was to put the future in us. He paid to put the future in us. We're meant to be walking in the power and the presence of God 
by what he's paid for, not just hoping for one day. And honestly, if I could, I'll just say one of the most asked questions I have is, People come to me and they say, Elisha, I just knew, I just wish I knew what God's will for my life was. I just wish I knew what God's will for my life was. I just don't know where to go. I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what college to go to, job to take, city to live in, state to go to, or, you know, possibly what to eat for breakfast. <laughs> there's, just this, there's just this immense questioning of what am I supposed to do? And I honestly cannot tell you. I can't tell any of you here what you're supposed to do, where you're supposed to go. I can't tell you what career to choose in life. I can't tell you what city you're supposed to live in, but I can actually tell you what the will of God is for your life. Well, Elisha, that seems like such a paradox. No, I can tell you the will of God for your life. And as Christians, as Christians, the rest of the world is putting their hope in the economy recovering. The rest of the world is putting their hope in, in medical um, solutions and all of these different things to come in the future. But as Christians, our hope is actually not based in something happening. It's not based in our circumstances changing. It's not based in, will you restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? Our hope as followers of Jesus is based in what he's already done. And so instead of constantly having our eyes locked on the horizon, hoping for one day, we are meant to stand firmly walking into the future, looking to the past. Not our past, but Christ's past. Point one on your outline, facing the future means I look to Christ's past. Possessing the promise of God over the future means I look to Christ's past. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting around verse 10, says this, I told you that I was going to tell you God's will for your life. It's not because I came up with it, it's because it's written in the Bible. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. For God's will for us, God's will for us, here's the, this eliminates a lot of time of counseling, God's will for us was to be made holy, to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which could never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice once once for all time, good for all time, and then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. He sat down because it is finished. And let me tell you something, possessing the future, walking into the future that God has planned for you means we're not looking forward. We're not looking forward to one day being good enough. One day, well, you know, one day I'll be good enough for God. I'm just hoping that one day comes that I'm finally okay, that I'm finally right, that I've finally done enough to atone for my sins. That day is not coming. It's already come, and we're meant to live from it, not for it. We're meant to live from, from forgiveness, not hoping for it one day. And we will have our future constantly robbed from us by guilt and regret and shame. And how often are we doing this? How often are we beating ourselves up again and again, day after day, trying to make something right that Jesus already made right 2,000 years ago? Once for all time. Once for all time. And God's will was for us to be made holy. To be made holy. Let me tell you something. He then explains the other ones. That was metaphorical. It never washed away sins, the old offerings. That's why they had to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Because it never actually made anybody holy. That was metaphorical. That was figurative. But this is God's will that we would be made holy. That's God's will over our life. And you might say, well, Elisha, what on earth does holy mean? Now you'll notice it doesn't say God's will was for us to be made religious doesn't say God's will was for us to be made rigid or stoic or boring or bland. God's will was for us to be made holy. There's only one that's holy, and that's God. And you might ask, well, then how am I supposed to be holy? And what does a holy life look like? Well, in the Bible, it's also written that Jesus, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And it also says that they have sent the Spirit of the Son into us, 
the Holy Spirit living in us. God's will was for us to be made holy. What does a holy life look like? It looks like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. It looks like forgiving someone when everyone else is holding stones. A holy life. A holy life looks like reaching out and praying for someone that no one else will touch. A holy life means including someone that everyone else has rejected. And it means forgiving people when they're trying to put you to death. That's what a holy life looks like. And that's the power that God has designed and desired to fill our life with. And if we're waiting, if we're waiting for one day, if we're waiting for the future, we'll never just stand on the fact that, well, he's given it to us. If somebody gave me a million dollars and I never believed it, guess how much of it I would spend? Zero. Zero. God's given us a whole lot more than a million dollars. And we need to believe that. We need to start spending it. We need to start living, saying, Jesus, I want to love like you. Jesus, I want to forgive like you. Jesus, I want to talk like you. And if you start sounding like the devil when you go through the roundabout, or if you start <laughs> sounding like the devil at the line at grocery... Just go back home and say, Jesus, remind me. Remind me who I am. Remind me of the truth. Remind me of the fact that you made me holy once for all time, and then you sat down because it was finished. It said that the other priest, the one of the old covenant, stood day after day. It says that Jesus sat down. The old priest never got to sit down. Jesus sat down because it was done. It was done. So when we look at that, and we're not waiting for one day to be what fixes our life, but rather we start living in the work that Jesus has already accomplished by his body, his crucifixion and his resurrection, then we're able to start living just a little bit like Jesus day to day. Point two on your outline, facing the future, means I live by the Holy Spirit in the present. I live by the Holy Spirit in the present. I like time travel movies. Anybody else like time travel movies? I love time travel movies. I love the, uh, like the parallel you know, timelines and the ripple effects and all that stuff. Like I can get into those time travel movies and get lost in them. But there's like one thing that's agreed upon as like a principle in every time travel movie, outside of Avengers Endgame, is that when you do something in the past, it affects the future forever. You know, Like, oh, don't go back in time. Like, great Scott, Marty, that's your mother. Like, when you go back in time and change something, it affects the world around you forever, right? So that's like the principle of time travel movies. But how often do we realize that that's the exact principle? That what we do today changes the future forever? If you can go back in time and move one rock, and then all of a sudden the future's changed, what happens today when we start living like Jesus? What happens today when we start living by the Holy Spirit, believing what God has already done for us through Jesus, and then we start acting it out, and we start living it out? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Whitney. The world will never be the same because you chose to love your kids like Jesus. It'll never be the same. Can you imagine if you didn't treat them well? Can you imagine if you treated them like garbage? The world, they would be injured, they'd be wounded for life, but because you love them like Jesus, the future will never be the same. Your boys are going to be world changers because you love them like Jesus. Clay, the world will never be the same because you chose to be a husband like Jesus, and you're choosing to be a husband like Jesus. Every single action that we make, every single action changes the future forever, and we have the ability by the Holy Spirit to change it for the good. And we want to talk about possessing the future and God's promise of the future. Remember, the Holy Spirit is God's promise of the future, the foretaste and the power of all future blessings. And we walk into the future by the present. And we're not doing this alone. Listen, in Hebrews chapter 10, continuing right where we left off, in Hebrews chapter 10, it's written, For by one offering, Jesus perfected forever those that are being sanctified, the Holy Spirit also witnessing this. Listen to this. This is the covenant that I will make with my people. This is God speaking. I will write my laws in their hearts, and I will write my laws in their minds. We're not in this alone. He's written the instruction manual within us. And then the pen of culture comes along and tries to add something. We've got to smack that away. The pen of our family history comes along and tries to write something. We've got to smack that away. He's written his laws in our hearts and our minds. He's given us the Holy Spirit to live daily. 
And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. Listen, don't worry. Don't ask saying, oh no, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? He says, because even the idolaters and the devil worshipers eagerly seek all these things too. And get this, I want you to hear this. This is a promise. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Your heavenly father knows that you need those things. He didn't say, well, that's silly. You should get over it. (laughs) He said, your heavenly father knows that you need these things, but seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness. And then all of these things will be provided. Talked about rich people with poor attitudes. I would venture to say that you can have everything you need, and if you're not satisfied with God, you'll think you don't have enough. You could have more. You could have more than anybody could ask for. Somebody else wishes they were in your shoes. But if you're not satisfied, you don't have enough. You don't have enough, and you'll be worrying about tomorrow. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that look like? What is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness means I have communication with God before I plug into Instagram. Seeking first the kingdom of God means that I check my heart with the good news of the gospel of Jesus before I turn on the TV news. Seeking first the kingdom of God means I go to God in prayer about a a decision, about something in my life, before I go and complain about it going badly. Seeking first the kingdom of God means I choose to honor my spouse instead of dishonoring my spouse. It means I choose to honor God with my money instead of dishonoring God with my money. And when we do this, when we do this, God has promised, he's promised that he will provide for us. He's gonna take care of us. And it's in our hands, man. It's in our hands to change the future forever. Living in the Holy Spirit. Living in the Holy Spirit. Living from the promise of God, the foretaste of future blessing. And if we are constantly putting our hope, if we're constantly putting our hope in circumstances, I just don't have enough. I don't, I don't know enough. If we're constantly putting our hope in these far off things, we're gonna miss the hope that God's already placed in us. Jesus knew, let me tell you something, God knew there would be a pandemic. God knew there would be bills to pay. God knew there would be hurt. God knew there would be pain. That's why he already, he already sent his son and Jesus already died, and already rose from the dead, and then already has given us his Holy Spirit to those of us that say, yes, Jesus, fill me with you. He knew, and he promised that in his Holy Spirit, we would have power. So possessing the promise of God's future means I look to Christ's past I live in the present by the Holy Spirit, and point three is I trust in God's promise of the future. Hebrews 10 that we've been reading out of concludes with this sentiment. Let us, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. God can be trusted to keep his promise. The sad truth is, uh, we live in a really, really broken world. We live in a world that's out of control. We live in a world that's, a lot of times, insane. And when Jesus stepped into situations, he brought healing, and he brought wholeness. That word holy just means whole, heal, complete. That's what God's brought for us. And when Jesus stepped into those situations, he began to bring the reality of the future the reality of healing. He brought the reality of restoration. He brought the reality of forgiveness straight from the future, straight from one day, straight from living with God in the future in heaven. He brought it straight into the moment and into the now. But we live in a very sad world. And I 
Unfortunately, not everyone on earth has a beautiful future life. There's tragedy. Uh, my friend Riley, one of the kindest people I'll probably ever know, probably one of the most humble and gentle guys, will never be any older than 25 years old because of how fragile this world is. Uh, my friend Nathan, who knew ever since we were teenagers, he'll never see his 30s because of how fragile this world is. And I know that you know someone that never got to see the future that could have been because of how fragile this world is. And God's promise is his spirit now, his presence now with us, and also a world to come. On the shores of Iwo Jima is Lloyd Delbert Maupin, who was in an amphibious assault vehicle about to approach the shores and the waves were crashing around them. He was no older than 20 years old and he laid his hand out and was praying for young men and their eternal salvation as they gave their lives to Jesus. And those amphibious assault vehicle doors slammed down and all of his friends were ripped to shreds by machine gun fire. Young men giving their lives to the Lord and being with him immediately in paradise. And he didn't know. He didn't know what the future held. But he did know he could hold firmly to the promise of God. He did know that he could hold firmly to the promise of God. That one day he would be with God. And that he was the safest in God's hands. He didn't know that his future as he survived and came out of the battle of Iwo Jima, of the first wave battalion of amphibious assault vehicles that landed on the shore, he didn't know that his future would be full of the Holy Ghost and fire, that he would start multiple churches, that he would go on to lead countless people to Christ, two of which, including my parents in the 1980s and 1990, that he would hold me up and dedicate my life to Jesus. He didn't know the future, and we don't know the future. But what I see him doing on that cold February morning in 1945 was holding firmly to the promise of God and living by the Holy Spirit in the present. I'm saying right here, right now, if we die, if we all die, I'm going to be the light of the world. I'm going to love these guys. I'm going to pray with them. I'm going to do my part. And we have the same opportunity in this world with all of the chaos, with all of the pain. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying you follow Jesus and then all of a sudden everything's okay. But I am saying that in a world full of machine gun fire and in a world full of people being torn apart, that we can be the light of the world, that we can be a force for good, that we can change the future forever by living in the promise of God. And as he stood there on that amphibious assault vehicle... There are young men he never got to see again, but this is the promise of the future. This is the hope that we hold on to. The same thing that the Apostle John saw on the island of Patmos in Revelation 21, verse 3. He said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people forever, and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. And all of these things will be gone forever. That's God's promise of the future. And he's given us his Holy Spirit as a foretaste of that exact future blessing. The series is called I Promise. You could just as easily call it I, comma, Holy Spirit. Living in us. God's will for every person in this broken, shattered world as they would be with him forever. 
And they would experience his love forever. That they would experience his joy forever. That they would experience his peace forever. His comfort forever. His kindness forever. Overflowing without end. And we have the opportunity now to say, Jesus, I don't know how it works. But I'm saying yes. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And maybe... Maybe you feel like you have no future. Maybe you're tuned in and you feel like your life is crushed and your life is worthless and you have no future and there is no hope. Can I just tell you that anything you place in the hands of God, anything you place in the hands of God is going to be transformed into something beautiful. And if you think you have no future and if your life is crushed, why not give it to God? Why not trust in his promise of the future? It's this simple. It's this simple. Just say, Jesus, I trust you. I trust in your death for my sins, and I trust in your resurrection for my new life, and I surrender. I surrender my life to your hands. Would you be Lord? Would you be Lord of my life? Ask him to fill you with his promise. Ask ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And I assure you, your life will be the safest it's ever been. God's will for you is good. God's will for you is love. God's will for you is life. And no matter how many mistakes you might think you've made, it's already finished. The payment for that being forgiven is finished. It's done. All we have to do is say, okay, I'll finally accept it. That once and for all, good for all time, he has made holy those that trust in him. It's not too far off. It's not one day. It's not someday. It's not Sunday. It's today. It's today. And we're going to sing this song one more time. I want to read this scripture because, because this is the truth. This is the promise. In Psalm chapter 100, verse 5, the Lord is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it'll amaze you, so kind that it'll astound you, and he is famous for his faithfulness towards all. And everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. And as we sing this song, We're going to sing this song one more time, man, and I'm excited because this is reality. This is truth. And as we sing these words, sing them over yourself. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I care where he's been and what he's done. And he says, I want you. Come on home. I love you. You're mine. Sing this song over yourself. Sing this song over your family. If it's doing amazing or if your family's broken to pieces, sing it over your family. And sing it over those that have hurt you because it might be the best way to start loving like Jesus. Let's do this. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children the children of his faith be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children
the good news. He's for you. He loves you. And he wants his favor to rest upon you for a thousand generations. We love you. We miss you. We can't wait to worship together right here, June 13th and 14th. And we'll see you online again next weekend, same time. We love you guys. God bless. We have experienced an incredible time of the presence and power of Jesus together online today. So thank you for tuning in. And if you want to stay connected with us throughout the week, you can go and download the Vineyard app at bccnd.org slash app or follow us on social media at bccnd. We love you. We miss you. We hope you're doing well. And we'll see you soon.